Okay, um, happy birthday, Wallace Harrison, uh, an important North American architect. He was never truly one of my favorites, but he built a, a church that was very admired by Rem Kolhas, for example, and uh, he built other things. He built a lot, actually, because he was uh, lucky. Uh, he was um, uh, he, the wife of his brother-in-law was, uh, uh, from the Rockefeller family, and so he became, uh, uh, you know, the architect of the Rockefeller family. And you can imagine uh, all kinds of uh, doors um, open for him. But he was uh, talented and interesting in some works. So we we'll, we'll, uh, we are going to see a few works by him. So Wallace Kerman Kerman Harrison, born as you can see, September twenty eighth in 1895, so uh, he was uh, just uh, eight years younger than Le Corbusier, was an American architect. Harrison started his professional career with the firm of Corbet Harrison and McMurray, participating in the construction of Rockefeller Center in New York City. He is best known for executing large public uh, projects in New York City and upstate New York, many of them a result of his long and fruitful personal relationship with Nelson Rockefeller, for whom he served as an advisor. Uh, it helps, of course, to have uh, you know, a fruitful and personal relationship with someone so powerful and so rich as uh, Nelson Rockefeller. This was the man. Uh, he also had a significant collection of uh, modern artworks by important uh, masters of the modern movement. He was a cultured man, and I would say an interesting man, uh, if we are to consider the simple fact that he was smoking. I think that those people who smoked and still smoke somehow have a fire within. Now, I'm not trying to idealize smokers. I used to smoke myself until 30 years ago when I got very sick and I stopped abruptly. But uh, I, I like to imagine, and maybe it's a fantasy, that the one who smokes is the one who has a fire within. And that fire needs to, to be somehow externalized through some fumes, you know? and. Uh, here we have it. You see the fume uh, above his head, coming from his uh, from his cigarette, uh, and uh, maybe here he is with a model for the United uh, United Nations building in New York. Uh, he was uh, his firm, uh, Harrison Abramovich, uh, um, was you know mainly involved with uh, with this building. Uh, there were influences coming from Le Corbusier, Oscar Niemeyer. But uh, that officially, they, they built it. Um, but he had, he had interesting things. And I, I myself could say I have a so-called personal relationship, not with Nelson Rockefeller, but with Wallace Harrison. And I will explain at the right moment in this uh, otherwise short presentation about him. Uh, here they are, you know, uh, in the back here, I think is um, him, uh, Wallace Harrison, you see on the left, Le Corbusier, you see here in the center, somehow Oscar Niemeyer, and uh, I don't know who the other gentlemen are. So Le Corbusier, Niemeyer, and in the back, uh, Wallace Harrison. Uh, talking about, uh, you know, the, the United, uh, United Nations uh, uh, building. So we begin with it. Uh, he built other things, but not all of them are quite impressive. So I, I, uh, I, I chose to, to, to talk just about a few buildings uh, built by him. So the United Nations building, uh, we all know it, it is here. Uh, and uh, this part is also of, of, of it. Uh, Le Corbusier claimed that, uh, you know, certain ideas of his were, you know, uh, inspiring, if not appropriated. Here in the back, we see uh, Chrysler building. Um, anyway. So uh, this is, um, the, was and is and will be uh, the United Nations building. 
there were influences, yes, from Le Corbusier, for Oscar Niemeyer, but the official firm uh, of architecture that built it was uh, Harrison Abramovich. Of course, it uh, had a lot to do with politics, and uh, this uh, architect was uh, very well connected, uh, and so, uh, but I, I wouldn't say he didn't deserve it. I, I, I still think he, he had something to say, and you will see that in, uh, in, in a few buildings that, that I will show. Here is the uh, Empire State Building, hidden a little bit behind the, in the background. Okay, so, uh, you know, it's not a building that uh, makes you say, wow, but it's a, it's a building which still has some modernistic dignity. And, uh, you know, it, it functioned for so many years as an arena for uh, an agora, uh, for, uh, for, uh, you know, uh, important uh, international discussions and decisions. And I think uh, the organism of the United Nations, although some uh, criticize it, uh, is necessary in a world full of conflicts and uh, injustices and so on. I once was part of a jury in an um, architectural competition in uh, in the United States, and uh, an artist from Greece uh, sent a project uh, where, you know, she tried to um, advocate in a way togetherness, the togetherness of nations by um, uh, melting down, so to speak, the, the specificities of the flags, the national flags. So if you blur if you blur the colors and the design of the flags, you get a kind of the same flag, meaning in a way we are all the same and there is no reason to you know, uh, have conflicts and so on. I think uh, it's an interesting idea to blur, to blur um, you know, uh, the excesses of, um, of nationalism doesn't matter how well intentioned uh, nationalism is, um, is is dangerous okay so on the left uh, the, um, the, the united nations building where harrison uh, had a, a word to say here we see on the right um, the the former panam building by walter gropius this is the building and it, it still has, I would say, some, some elegance in its, um, you know, modernistic uh, mid-century uh, fashion or aesthetics. This is how the, the site was before the building was built. So after the war, there was a great need for something like this. So, you know, uh, and I think still is whatever some skeptics would say. It is important to know that there is a, a place where nations could come together and discuss uh, important matters. Now, the Great Hall uh, of New York, um, this, is, uh, this is an interesting work because it is in a way futuristic. And on the other hand, it is, if I am to risk a word, uh, medieval. And this attracts me, this uh, dichotomy between modernistic and medieval. 
it's 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 a look uh, look at this building done by uh, Wallace uh, Harrison. Um, it's interesting. It's part of the 1939, or was part of the 1939 um, World Exhibition in New York City, where he also be the, built the, the Trilon and the Perisphere, and we are going to see them, which became uh, symbols of New York City. Uh, unfortunately, they don't exist any longer, but uh, this building is also interesting, you know, and uh, Again, this, this architect is not as well known as he, I think, he deserves. Um, so I don't know exactly the function of this building. I think it was meant for some kind of, a, you know, an exhibition or space for, uh, for science. Um, but uh, aesthetically speaking, uh, is uh, engaging. And, uh, you know, for that time, uh, he, you know, the, the, this kind of building, uh, I'm sure, uh, surprised many. And, and also surprising is the decorative element, the ornamental uh, element, which repeats itself on this undulating uh, uh, facade. Uh, and even from the inside, uh, the, the effect is uh, rather uh, pleasant, I would say. So Wallace, ha uh, Wallace Harrison did have uh, qualities uh, as an architect. There is a certain purity here and, uh, you know, a certain uh, audacity in choosing, uh, you know, a certain architecture. Uh, we are going to see also a church, which I mentioned that um, Rem Kolhas uh, uploaded, and I think it deserves to be uploaded, which is, again, not, not very well known. So it's possible that this building still exists. I don't know, but uh, you know, it, it even makes me think of, uh, of uh, certain works by Jean Nouvel, like for example, L'Institut du Monde Arabe, which is uh, not using uh, you know, such uh, waves in the facade, but is using a decorative element, which makes me think a little of what we see here. I think it was uh, you know, rather courageous uh, mid-century to propose uh, you know, uh, earlier than mid-century, uh, something like this. And still, it's a modernistic uh, statement. Yeah, I uh, I like this work, and I wish I had um, I had more images with it. As I said, it's it's a rather short presentation, but it's an introduction to an architect whose birthday is today, and uh, and an architect I think who deserves to be known. Now, I mentioned this, the Trilon and the Perisphere, which became the, the, the symbols of New York City in 1939. Uh, and uh, they are in a way amazing, you know, this big sphere and here is the Trilon, some kind of a very, very slender triangular uh, pyramid. Uh, Yes, with this work, I, I have a strange uh, uh, connection somehow, and I'll, I will tell you about it in a, in a, in a short while. Uh, so this was an exhibition which was supposed to celebrate, um, you know, the advancements in science, uh, futuristic uh, optimism and so on. And, uh, you know, the, the abstractness of the work uh, and uh, even its symbolism, I think, are uh, amazing, is, uh, even for today. Now, imagine these were built in 1939, before the war. Uh, you know, I, I think even Boulet and Ledoux would have admired what we look at here. Because if we talk about visionary architecture, well, in a way, Emphatically, this seems to say something exactly in this realm of uh, visionary architecture. And you see how big these are. You know, I mean, uh, this is a huge room, and even the Trilon. I mean, uh, you know, it's it's a work which is not uh, which is forgotten or not well known. And look at this; they became the symbols of uh, of New York City. And this was the, the site of the, of the World uh, 
International, the World Exhibition in 1939 in, in New York City. So it was uh, Wallace Harrison who, who did this. And strangely, and uh, I am very honest with you, I did a project very similar to what he did here without knowing anything about this. Consciously, I knew nothing about this. I showed my project and you are going to see it. And in fact, I did show it a few times. It was for a competition for Times Square in New York. And um, I show after I participated and I didn't win any prize, but I did the work. I showed it to a colleague of mine in the office, architecture office I was working in. And he said, these are very similar to the um, uh, Trilon and the uh, Perisphere by uh, Wallace Harrison. I knew nothing about it. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. So uh, he brought me a Time magazine where I saw for the first time these things. But it's amazing. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is possible. In all honesty, I, I could admit that there is the possibility that maybe I saw somewhere, but I think I'm honest enough. And, and also, uh, I, I don't think I would have liked to fall in, um, you know, to be ridiculed for uh, copying uh, or, uh, you know, or plagiarizing something that was so famous. I mean, the very symbols of New York City. I, I wouldn't do something like this. I don't drink, uh, I don't drink at all except buttermilk. So, uh, but I'll show you the project, but it's very, very similar to, to what he did then in 1939. In my case, the sphere is much, much, much smaller. In fact, it's a huge uh, urban uh, throne or chair, but you have this duality, a sphere, or almost a sphere in my case, it's a cut sphere and a narrow pyramid, uh, very similar to this. But I did them in the context of Times Square. Uh, anyway, uh, in my opinion, I mean, it's an opinion, I, can, I cannot verify, but I think uh, Wallace Harrison uh, tried to depict through these, uh, uh, through the Trilon and the Perisphere in a way, the, the, the duality of, um, of stability and instability, because the sphere is a paradigm of stability and the pyramid, even if very tall and very slender, is somehow some kind of a pyramid, uh, paradigm of stability. So you have uh, a pair uniting stability with instability. And I think a similar thought perhaps uh, animated me when I did that project. Anyway, look at the interior is a you know a vast panorama that people look at. Uh, you know, was was a very large uh, building, uh, and uh, yes, courageous for that time and maybe any time. You know, a sphere which sits uh, almost precariously, or then it is connected here with a with a trilon. Wallace Harrison. Here they are. And also it's interesting, and I didn't know this, I swear to you that they became the symbols of New York City. If I knew, I probably would have done something else, but I didn't. And it's very interesting. And this happens also in science where you have two scientists discover almost at the same time or uh, with a difference of a few years, the same thing. It's, it's, um, it's possible. Anyway, um, but it's an interesting work, I think, very interesting. And uh, I'm not saying this because, uh, you know, here uh, the word appears inventors, inventors. Well, there are two here, Wallace Harrison and André Fui, who uh, I think you, I don't know who he was. He's, uh, anyway, Harrison is here, of course, and uh, it's possible that, you know, he had an important word to say uh, in, uh, in this, uh, about this project. In my project, uh, if you look here, the plan, the sphere, the diameter of the circle is much bigger than, uh, you know, the, the side of the trilon. Uh, in my case, the, what is derived from a sphere is, is smaller than, um, than the size of, you know, my tower. Let's not call it trilon. Anyway, um, in my opinion, an interesting work, and again, I lament that they had been destroyed. They should not have been destroyed. 
even more so considering that they became the symbols of New York City. And here is, uh, you know, the whole uh, drawing uh, with them. Um, Uh, he also did, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know if he did them, but uh, you see, they became so fashionable that uh, the trilon and the spear made it even on the top of hats for ladies. Maybe here there was also some kind of uh, nostalgia for the, the unicorn or something. Anyway, they, they were very famous indeed. And here is a model. The New 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 York World's Fair, 1939. Um, but you know, it, it, it is anyway. I, I'll arrive with my 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 project. Um, quite a coincidence, I would say. Anyway. Um, you know, this kind of architecture is, is not uh, done uh, often even now, you know, this, you know, there is something of course pharaonic about it and, uh, but uh, it's meanings, it's symbolic meanings. I mean, look at all these people staying in line in order to enter into the sphere. And indeed they are huge. I mean, you see the human silhouettes and you can imagine the height of, of the trilon. An interesting world uh, world exhibition. They, of course, there were also stamps with the uh, postal stamps with the uh, with the trilon and the and the perisphere as it was called. Three cents, and this was my project, and you probably saw it. I also had some kind of a trilon. Well, this um, narrow, tall uh, tower. And I also had some kind of a sphere or derived from the sphere, but in my case, it was a, an urban chair uh, and it was connected with a certain symbolism derived from uh, architecture and alchemy. Uh, I was reading at that time a book, uh, Psychology and Alchemy by Carl Jung, which I liked very much, where I learned that uh, the, the alchemist was trying to unite the queen and the king, uh, the feminine principle with the masculine principle, red with white, red, red symbolizing the king, the sun, uh, fire, uh, and uh, south, the south, while white symbolizing the queen, water, uh, north, uh, and um, I, I, I played with the opposite. So because of the of the of the special um, urban context that this was the famous 42nd Street. I think 42nd Street was here. And this was 48th Street. And at equal distance from them, it was 45th Street in Manhattan, where um, Broadway and 7th Avenue, or Broadway and 7th Avenue, I don't know which one is now. Anyway, Broadway and 7th Avenue intersected at what New Yorkers call the crossroads of the world at 45th Street. And you see, it's a situation uh, almost like an hourglass, you know. And so what I did, I imagined two towers, although the competition asked for one tower, for Times Tower, that, but I proposed two because I was, I was interested in the duality between the white and the red, between the king and the queen, between fire and water, between the sun and the moon. And, uh, and at South, I, I imagine the red tower, which if you would have uh, um, uh, lowered on the, on the, on the ground would have, would have matched exactly the, you know, the, the portion of the website here. And the white tower, if you would have done the same thing, the, the, the top parts of the towers would have met exactly at 45th Street where the intersection between 7th Avenue and Broadway happened, which is called by New Yorkers, the, cent the, the crossroads of the world. So, but uh, still I, I, I find a certain relationship, uh, you know, between the project built by uh, uh, Wallace Harrison and what I did, because I also have a, a narrow slender uh, pyramid and uh, which he called the trilon and some kind of a sphere. 
But in my case, the sphere I cut in order to accommodate a sitting mythical figure on the white half, so to speak, of the world, although it, it was more than a half. I just sectioned the sphere here. I placed the red king, uh, you know, an, an, an individualized large being. But this was at the scale of, of, of Times Tower of, or Times Square. It was so big that you could have literally walked underneath the seat of this, should I call it urban chair? And the same symmetrically on the other side was a red, huge urban chair or throne on which the white queen sat. So I thought that in your mind, you would unite the two and you would get some kind of three-dimensional eight, uh, number eight, because you would unite the, the two section spheres and thus gain uh, a sense of wholeness, uniting the masculine principle with the feminine principle, uniting in a way the, the opposites. Anyway, moving back to Wallace Harrison, the fish church, which is the, the church that um, Rem Kolch has uh, admired, and I think uh, with good reasons, because I think it's an excellent building, uh, truly excellent. Uh, this was built together with Abramovich, uh, but he was probably the designer, I don't know. Anyway, they built it together. And I think this kind of, uh, you know, uh, modernization, abstractization of the Gothic is, uh, is very uh, inspired and uh, would be very welcome, doesn't matter when we build. Uh, towards the outside, but even towards the outside is, uh, is, uh, is a building which uh, has a surprising, uh, surprisingly fresh modernity. And uh, um, again, this is a building which should be known. And uh, inside, yes, this uh, almost organic uh, geometry, organic, the, these triangulations, this, it, it is a space which, in my opinion, is probably uh, very uplifting. Um, and you know, this is sophisticated architecture. And, you know, I wonder why such a building is not studied in schools. And you see here, because the, the glass parts of the building depict um, various scenes, you know, from uh, religion, from the Bible. The south side of the nave depicts scenes from the resurrection. Near the center, slightly above eye level, may be seen the empty tomb in blue glass. Emanating from this is shown the angel as lightning, which stabs the sky in three directions. Figures of women and the frightened cent centurions may be seen to the left and right of the tomb. A Roman's horse in blue glass is shown at the far right. Again, at the top left of the scene is the suggestion of the holy city. The large bands of red on the left side symbolize sunset at the crucifixion and sunrise at the resurrection. Now, since I talk from a country which is so stuck in its religious dogmas, I would say this is a building which is creative. And being creative, it truly honors God. It is truly an homage to God. It is truly the house of God. Not being creative, I would say, we are not honoring in any way God. So those who, who run the church, uh, those administrators, sterns, austere administrators who know nothing about creativity, in my opinion, sorry for the hardness of my words, they also know nothing about God. Because if they, they would uh, uh, have the, the, the wandering... Uh, you know, eye and curiosity of a child, uh, the mysteries of the world, nature, and so on, they would understand that uh, everything is a, a huge uh, mystery and that the creator was indeed uh, uh, an unbelievable artist. Not perfect, it's true, and there are many deficiencies in the world, but we cannot say that it was not an, uh, an absolutely amazing creation. That is, if we believe in, uh, in uh, creation, that it was created just like us. Some people think we were not. So uh, whatever, I think a church like this one makes us think and uh, makes us uh, feel. And uh, what else can I say?
uh, I think Wallace Harrison did an excellent job here, and I'm glad that uh, Rev Kolchas um, thought in the same way. It is an excellent building. Look at this. You know, here you don't need words, you don't need icons, you don't need explanations, you don't need dogmas. It's the light which penetrates geometry and uh, problematizes it in a way, but it's a conjunction actually, just like in the two uh, principles I tried to marry in the time square. Here, you see the conjunction be between light, which comes from God or uh, from the divine, and uh, the geometry of man, which was the creation of man. And, and the two collaborate to create this uh, enhancing, uh, enticing uh, interior. And, and, and the geometry is not, uh, is not uh, you know, uh, is not attempting to arrive at some kind of a supremacy in the dialogue with light. No, it, it fragments itself. Uh, it is fragmented by, by light. So it, it, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's a very, very good uh, uh, building. It's also a narrative building because you saw the, those uh, stained glass windows, which are modern, uh, depict scenes that are uh, narrated in the sacred book uh, of, uh, of uh, Christianity. Uh, this one maybe is a little bit uh, diagrammatic, uh, but uh, all in all, I think it's 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 an interesting uh, it's an interesting building. And here is the architect, uh, you know, uh, with the sleeves of his shirt uh, brought uh, up in order to um, artistically uh, paint, draw. Artistically, yes, yes, it's good to see such. Uh, you know, so-called nervousness on the drawing, meaning temperament and intense thinking and uh, artistic expression. It's beautiful when you can create, you know, it is beautiful when you are allowed to be honest with your own feelings and emotions and thoughts and to express them as an homage to life, in essence. Now, the Empire State Plaza in uh, Albany, New York. Albany is the capital of, um, uh, of uh, the state of New York. And he built here all these buildings. You see them, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So it's, uh, it's an idealistic, almost utopian, uh, you know, uh, urban uh, arrangement of uh, various buildings, governmental buildings, of, of an almost visionary nature. Uh, of course, we know about Brasilia, built by Niemeyer and uh, Lucio Costa and others. But here, Wallace Harrison, uh, much less known than Niemeyer, uh, in Albany, New York, built something somehow, somehow a little bit in, the, in that spirit uh, of an uh, idealistic architecture that tried to accommodate itself to the needs of bureaucracy, governmental bureaucracy. And I think in a, in a sense and to an extent, he succeeded. Uh, you know, you might say these buildings are a little bit, uh, you know, imposing, uh, you know, a little bit maybe too monumental, a little bit harsh in the uh, regularity and, and geometry. But um, I also think they have, uh, they have dignity and uh, they do have force. Uh, anyway, uh, and, uh, you know, then he also showed uh, his uh, ability to, to propose and to accommodate to the context something that perhaps uh, Brunku should have loved, you know? Uh, uh, so even this building is, is, is not bad. You know, it, yeah, it's more predictable. Yes, it is, uh, you know, uh, it's not very surprising, but uh, uh, 
all in all, it's an interesting, modernistic, uh, large, uh, complex governmental pro uh, uh, complex uh, in an important state uh, and uh, should be known, I think. Now, the egg, the egg which we saw, and that's why I refer to, to Brancusch, because he uh, sculpted uh, an egg uh, or the beginning of the world. Uh, here, this man built a building which has functions within. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, again, I think he was courageous. And it got built. So there, the, the uh, you know, if you stand by your intuitions and you, 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 you have the chance, of course, he had the chance to be very well connected at the highest level within the state. The things happened, they got built. So who said that, you know, governmental buildings have to be by necessity, you know, rather conformist and uh, so on, uh, not necessarily. It's enough to think of a parliament building in Edinburgh by Mirais and Talia Bue to realize that indeed, uh, if you are creative uh, and you fight for your ideas, you might in the end uh, uh, win. So there, you know, uh, concrete, exposed concrete in a, in a pure form. Albany, the state of New York, the United States, architect designer, uh, Wallace Harrison. To me, it is clear that this architect, this gentleman, this man uh, had a level of, uh, of purity in him, you know, and you see from the shape itself, you know, and yes, it was uh, very well built, you know, but uh, only someone I think who has uh, a certain level of integrity uh, and purity can imagine and can build in this way the egg in Albany. Unfortunately, not all his buildings are like this. Uh, there are other buildings he built, which are not, uh, in my opinion, uh, truly great, but uh, a few things I think he built uh, uh, sufficiently well to, 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 uh, to, not, to be, uh, not to be forgotten. And there is also a certain variety of architectural language, you know, because he built this, he built these towers, this one, and then uh, the egg. And so there is a certain variety here. And without words, it is clear for anyone who visits Albany that this must be some kind of a center. And it is, it is the administrative, political, social center of uh, the capital of, uh, of the state of New York. It is not New York City, it's Albany, upstate New York. And here you can see he also built this building. So, you know, th there is a, um, a conglomerate here of, of uh, various functions and various buildings. And you can see the difference between the city at large and what happens here. Here you can see, uh, you can perceive the will of the architect. There is a willful architect here uh, who worked with certain uh, intentions. And these intentions uh, are, uh, uh, I would say obvious without words. Okay, so let's wish him happy birthday. He deserved a larger presentation, but still, we pay homage to him on his birthday. And now, in an even uh, less sufficient uh, uh, presentation, uh, I will uh, uh, attempt to say a few words about uh, Confucius and architecture. I think it is important, even if we know nothing about, uh, about uh, the sage, the Chinese sage, uh, I think uh, it's important to know that he existed to begin with, 
and to um, attempt uh, to connect somehow from a specific domain, in this case, architecture. Uh, and uh, some connections are possible. In fact, more than some, I could have amplified the presentation, I could have, because there are many examples on the web of temples of Confucius, uh, but uh, I only chose a work which is uh, contemporary uh, and actually uh, some kind of uh, renovation, uh, refurbishment of some existing buildings, which I like very much. And um, as, as for Confucius, you maybe know, China had uh, two uh, pillars of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of wisdom, or I don't know how to call them. One was Confucius, the pragmatist and the moralist, uh, the philosopher, and the other one was the mystic, Lao Tzu or Lao Tse. So with these two incredible forces in the field of, uh, of spirit, uh, China built a culture that uh, shows its uh, proudness even today. Uh, I read a few things by Confucius, not a lot at all, but uh, he disappointed me because um, if I remember correctly, he proved to be a misogynist. And I read uh, yesterday, in fact, that yes, there are commentators uh, saying that apparently he was, yet he was a major force in China, and not only in China. So um, Confucius, Confucius does need to be known, does need to be read. And uh, I know there are many people to, to, who deserve perhaps this uh, chance to be read and to be discussed. He is one of them. Um, okay, so, um, you know, this is one of the many physical representations of the sage of the, of the, of the wise men of, uh, uh, of China. And I will show you a work now which attracted my attention. The renovation of the Nanjing Confucius Temple by DC Alliance. I don't know who the, the DC Alliance are or where or will be, uh, or no, are, but I think they did an excellent job. And uh, I think this, uh, you know, almost, well, in a way, modernistic interventions in a, in a, in, in a context that was rather traditional, I think was done very skillfully. And, you know, I, I like to imagine that if Confucius saw it, uh, he might have liked it. There is, a, you know, I, I also like the fact that it's not the typical temple where, you know, you, you bow in front of it and it's uh, aloof, separated from other buildings, you're usually in a central um, position. Here, there are all kinds of functions. Uh, and also even shops are the, uh, so it's some kind of a, I'm not saying that Confucius was a sacred uh, figure or he was not really, uh, you know, connected with, uh, with the religion. He was a philosopher, uh, but um, he was more concerned with ethics. But, but there are many temples, Confucian temples built for Confucius. And the temple usually is, is, is refers to uh, a sacred function. But in this case, we have the profane and the sacred uh, meeting together. And I, I think uh, it was a good job done here. It's also not imposing, it's not, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's human in scale. It's, there are parts that are modern, there, there are parts that are traditional. And, uh, you know, I think it's very gracefully done, this uh, uh, renovation. Uh, China is, uh, had a very old uh, culture and, uh, and um, you know, they, they, that culture, that um, old culture sustains, sustains the country. Even this part of this ensemble of, of buildings I find uh, uh, more than acceptable. I think is uh, is um, 
I, I like the fact that it is not uh, monumental in the best sense of the word. In fact, it's not even really monumental. So in this way, somehow Confucius or the memory of Confucius is, uh, is uh, connected to the street, to the people, to anyone. It doesn't matter uh, on a bicycle or in a Mercedes. And, and the ability to, to unite the, the new with the old, I think is, is obvious here. And although usually I'm not uh, very fond of commerce, somehow these little shops here at the bottom add to the charm of the whole, uh, of the whole complex. And what we look at is Chinese. I mean, even if I didn't know, I would have said, well, this must be somewhere perhaps in China. It is. It is, because uh, without uh, screaming, I am China, still uh, it is gently Chinese, what we look at. Modern, old, Chinese, but not only because, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can respond to its uh, aesthetical virtues. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are from. So it, it's not a nationalistic building. In a way, perhaps we can uh, ascribe to it that uh, Swedish word. It was the Swedish word uh, uh, some years ago, glocal. It's both global and local. And, and the building, the architecture has dignity. And I imagine uh, this is also um, maybe the, the, the core of, of the philosophy of, of Confucius. Uh, even ornament, or uh, as I call them, architectural embroideries are not absent. Discreet or uh, not uh, really intrusive or, uh, you know, highly demanding, but they exist. And this is, uh, so it's a complex of buildings. There are many buildings here. I don't know if it's just one specific building that uh, that is the, the actual temple, maybe this one, you know, considering its position. But all in all, it's an island of uh, architectural dignity and an invitation to live uh, in, a, in a civilized, but also graceful way on this earth. And there are all kinds of buildings here. You see very, you know, uh, maybe an impressive uh, brought, I mean, uh, analyzed individually, uh, but, um, Together, I think they create a community of buildings that is uh, also perhaps in a way connected with, uh, with Confucius, because I don't think Confucius advocated, uh, you know, individualism, uh, but rather coming together. It would be very interesting to read both Confucius and Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu or Lao Tse was the mystic, and I, you know, temperamentally, I'm more attracted to Lao Tzu, Lao Tse, who even saved my life at one, at, at one time. But they are both important. And you see, again, the ornament. The ornament is important. Even fragments of ornament, you know, uh, here and there, you know, small again, uh, you know, architectural embroideries, why not? They soften uh, uh, an architectural image, which is otherwise risked to be too harsh. It's a hybrid situation, it's a hybrid architecture, but I think uh, the whole is, um, I, I liked it when I saw it, and that's why I chose to, uh, I chose to present it. And now we, we go to uh, the hometown of Confucius, and I'll show images from the, you know, from the cemetery. I don't know exactly which one is his tomb, I, I didn't read the text, but uh, we begin, uh, the quest for the temple of Confucius in his own hometown 
uh, with this quotation from him that everything has beauty, but not everyone sees it. Uh, what about this? Everything has beauty. Uh, it's hard to accept in a way because, you know, we, we, we really don't see beauty in everything, but there is some truth in this that it depends. I mean, we have this saying, it's in the eye of the beholder. So if there is some beauty within us, in our soul, then we project this beauty out to, out, outside. Uh, um, and uh, then, you know, anything could become, could be, could be seen from a certain point of view, at least, as being beautiful. In 1994, UNESCO granted world heritage status to a trio of sites in Khufu associated with a philosopher the temple of Confucius, the cemetery of Confucius, and the former home of his first descendants, the Kong family mansion. Um, so I'll, I'll just show some images from, uh, from, this, uh, from this town, uh, Khufu. And uh, as you can see, it is uh, acknowledged by UNESCO as a world heritage, it has a, a world heritage status. Although I like modernity, I'm also very fond of tradition. I, I, um, I have an old book uh, about China from 1928 uh, made by in Germany. And uh, there are beautiful, beautiful pictures of old villages in China at that time, uh, truly with, uh, uh, so modest. And there were poor villages, but with incredible you know, slender pagodas and uh, very romantic pictures. I love those old villages in China. And indeed, uh, I read that actually China has a, an, an unbelievable uh, treasure of um, thousands and thousands and thousands of old villages. Unfortunately, they also destroyed many in the process of uh, rapid urbanization, but they still have a lot. And I think this is what differentiates China from the rest of the so-called uh, developed world. You know, uh, if China uh, connects with that rural culture, with those villages, countless villages, I think even culturally China will be uh, unbeatable. I mean, uh, it, it would be indeed uh, uh, a nation uh, to, to, uh, to even inspire all of us because I mean, look even at this space, you know, I, I am not Chinese, far from it, but if I compare this with, well, I'm not French either, but if I compare this with Versailles, uh, you would say there's no reason to make such a comparison. I'm more attracted to this. I'm more attracted to this architecture, you know, which is, uh, I don't know, it's not just because of its exoticism, but I don't know, I think it has beauty and it has also a, some kind of a combination between uh, grace, grace and will between geometry, you know, the rhythm of the structural elements and there is a certain rawness, roughness even, but there is also delicacy, you know, uh, refinement, uh, these ornaments, they, uh, they soften uh, everything. So, there is a conjunction of opposites, and I like conjunctions of opposites. And all in all, it's an interesting call. I don't know exactly what its function is, but uh, I like it very much. And it is Chinese, but at the same time, it belongs to the world. It belongs to all of us, because beauty has no frontiers. Some things are more like here, you know, you have to know certain narratives, you have to, but. Um, uh, here you don't need, you, you don't even need explanations. Now, again, this is China. This is not uh, some uh, Baroque or Rococo part of Europe. It's China. But in China, we see ornamentation, don't we? Uh, you know, I am asking again, 
why is our time so against ornament? You know, if you remove ornament from the history of architecture, you remove, you almost remove the whole of the history of architecture. Um, I like this picture. It's, uh, you know, with a man sitting there on a chair, dreaming, you know, talking about the Vita Contemplativa, we're there. You know, it's a man who thinks, who feels, who, who maybe he composes a poem or he simply is absent-minded. It doesn't matter. He certainly doesn't pollute the air and doesn't contribute to the climate change in, uh, in uh, negative ways. Ornament again. Why did people use ornaments, you know, all those uh, thousands of years? Why? And why don't we? Now we enter the cemetery of the greatest sage because he was called Confucius the greatest sage. To be honest with you, I'm a little bit skeptical that people truly know that today on the 28th of September is his birthday. But, you know, this is what uh, I found on the sites that I can consult that he was born today. Anyway, it's a, in, in a way, it's a pretext. It's by the way of Confucius' birthday. We learn new things, we discuss new things, we, learn, we, we, we see uh, we see things that for probably normally we wouldn't uh, contemplate. So this is uh, what he said, the greatest sage, meaning, meaning Confucius. If we don't know life, how can we know death? And how right he is. Do we know life? Of course not. We think we know it, but we don't. So even less death, how could we know death? You know, it's impossible. We, we don't even know life. And this is the truth. We don't. And so the image is from this cemetery, which is, uh, has the, the UNESCO heritage, um, uh, world heritage, it's a world heritage site. Um, and uh, again, I lament that, that we don't even think about the afterlife. In architecture, you know, maybe the latest or the, the last truly important achievement relating to the afterlife is, is maybe the, the, the Brion Cemetery by Carlos Carpa. But uh, I, I think it is, uh, it, it is perhaps even highly necessary to reconsider our relationship with, uh, with, uh, with the afterlife and thus with death. And maybe, maybe uh, uh, then, uh, I mean, we could do this. I, I, I imagine if we assume again, at least to a certain level, the contemplative life. Uh, you know, the, it, it's in the clepsydra of existence, life and death nourish each other somehow. Through memory, the dead is nourishing the, the, the ones who are alive. And then the ones who are alive, the life, their life, is uh, is nourishing uh, the, the world uh, beyond the, the yeah the, the afterlife. So it's a connection, I would say, between uh, the two cups of the the existential clepsydra or uh, or hourglass. I don't think this is his uh, tomb. Um, or uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's a cemetery which has uh, various people buried there. Or maybe it is, but if it is, it is surprisingly, I would say, uh, almost modest, despite the fact that it's that vertical element, you know, uh, easy to remark as such. But uh, otherwise, considering the, the statue in the, in the pantheon of uh, cultural and spiritual pantheon of, of China, of Confucius, you would imagine at least a pantheon like uh building anyway there are all kinds of scenes even the fact that there is this maybe this is a room uh, for uh, you know those who clean up the cemetery you know and but i like the fact that you know it's nothing uh, you know it's nothing uh, you know hidden the doors are open uh, uh, there is a modesty here that that uh, i i think uh, uh, should be welcomed even uh, in the vicinity of the highest, um, you know, cultural or philosophical uh, or um, 
ethical uh, accomplishment like he had. Nature in its quietness is always uh, a great uh, soother. And uh, sculptures, sculptures of animals, statues, what they represent, I do not know. But I'm glad that uh, China uh, didn't forget, uh, didn't forget the animals. And the animals are uh, uh, mysterious forces in a way, you know, they, they are protectors. Maybe they are protectors of the dead, maybe I don't know. You have to know the mythology of the specific culture, and I don't. So this is the this is the cemetery uh, where Confucius is. Maybe he is under this uh, uh, mound uh, here, or I don't know. All in all, maybe the whole cemetery somehow, uh, you know, dedicated to him in with various uh, uh, manifestations. But all in all, I think this short trip through China, uh, through this part of China, related, um, you know, uh, with Confucius, is an invitation to to contemplate a different kind of life, where we make room for uh, for uh, contemplation, for spirit, for philosophizing, for uh, that beyond that we don't address often at all. And yes, uh, why not? We should also have tricycles or bicycles, fold, folding bicycles. Uh, we should also have stores, of course. You know, it's this beautiful meeting between the profane and the sacred, which I think create uh, the wholeness of life. Uh, maybe we can write again on stones, you know, some messages that matter to us. Why not? Instead of watching the Hollywood movies. Uh, you might say this is about death, and of course it is, it is a cemetery, but it is also about life. Uh, um, I, I, I don't think. I don't think that if you neglect death, you are actually saying an amplified yes to life. I actually think the two complement each other. And indeed, I, I think you know if you don't know, if you don't try to understand the duality, life, death, then you impoverish your own life significantly. And look at these beautiful trees, which do not grow perfectly perpendicular on the on the earth as you can see so those who think that trees are uh, creating a 90 degrees uh, situation with the earth are wrong you know the trees are more free than we are they grow as they feel like it um, i like this picture very much okay so uh, that's it for today goodbye confucius and goodbye um, Wallace Harrison. Sorry, um, 